Ah, here she is. It's the <laughs> notorious Haley Zale. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting ready to sh shoot us over to Facebook really quick. Cool, cool. And we will be getting ready to get it popping. And I have an amazing compilation of conversation for you, my friend. Awesome. Absolutely. Way overdue, but <laughs> boy, there's no better time than the present. Here we go. We're getting ready to go live in a couple of seconds. And then I'm going to turn my camera on and you can possibly, you might want to cover your face because you might not want to see me immediately. I might oh, startle you. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> oh, yeah, let us get it. It is going down. <laughs> yes, I'm so pumped up. And, and I actually had just finished the lodge uh, uh, with the mayor. So I was like, Oh, wow. Your message, yeah, your message came through, and I was like, Holy moly, two for one. <laughs> I know. I just happened to be at my dad's house. So that's cool. Oh, well, this is, we are absolutely about to be live on our page which is 145,000 strong look and they love some boxing and today <laughs> it is about to go down let me get going and my mic's on voila <laughs> i love that background oh, oh, some Holy moly. Dust that off is the so we, belt too for today. <laughs> that is, oh man, that is awesome. Holy moly. How are you doing, Haley? I'm great. I miss boxing. I miss yeah. watching, you know, the Friday night fights. I miss um I miss being involved as a judge. Yeah. I, um, you know, staying healthy and safe, of course. All is right. the so here is your summary. So it goes program. over everything we talked about. Okay. In the back here goes. I'm excited. Oh, but getting some before we get going, I'm right. going to introduce okay. us in the show. Today, we're live today. on the fight show right. with your host, Dr. Right. Okay. Bradley. If you like to get your like, fight doctor. And today, our special guest is. Hey, Dale, you okay. okay. of the greatest yep. middleweight okay. in the front okay. turn of the 20th century, okay. Tony, okay. Okay. the yeah. man of right. steel, okay. my man. Welcome today. It's a pleasure to have you on board. Thank Truth you. Is. So nice to be here. Oh, I'm having a little feedback. I'm sorry, just a technical difficulty. Is it me or you? Uh, I think it's on my end. Can you hear me okay? Oh, if you got your feed on, if you got your feed on, just mute. Like if you got like another media, social media going, just mute that if that's it. Yeah, I think that's going on. Hold oh, on. that's it. Just take your time. Ain't no rush. The audience is 1000%. Undiagnosed bacterial right, infection. Yeah, yeah. So, um, anyway. Let's see, sorry about this. No, it's okay. I think it's my voice memos are going. Oh, well, take your time. Okay. <laughs> I, I am trying to figure out. Okay, there you go. Why is it not so better afterwards? That's good then. Yeah. I'll get you checked out right at that window. Okay, okay thank you. This is so cool. Okay. I am so ready. I've got to pull my thing up so I can keep everything front and center. You good on your end? Good. I hear you good. Yeah. Nice. Cool. So what I want to do is for those who have never tuned into our page, our, our podcast, what we have been doing is first being a part of the boxing community, first of all, is a privilege, as you know it and we pulled together and we galvanized. Well, the series in which you're a part of today, Haley, is titled The Boxing Royals. <laughs> I love it, I love it. Yeah, so we had to not only pay homage to the men, like you see Henry Armstrong and the guys that are on this, this mural here, yeah. but 
the families in which were behind these individuals who, you know, definitely position our sport in, in front in the entire century of the 20th century, boxing was front period and it carried it. And who were behind these legends were the people like yourself, your father, and everyone that played a role in those guys walking across that aisle and getting to that ring and sacrificing to create legacy. So we felt that it was, you know, we were entitled to highlight the individual families who are taking part, you know, like, you know, J. Marie Moore, Archie Moore's daughter, and, you know, Paul Durrell, you know, everyone, Yvonne Durrell's son, all of these individuals, the daughter of Joe Lewis, every, everyone is so, you know, you, you have the title of royalty, but people truly do not understand what that, that moniker means to be that, to play that role. And so that's why we created this series here under the Fight Show banner, because it was just important for those individuals to know what the sacrifices. And we have a lot of young fighters, a lot of young coaches, you know, personal people from outside of the world of boxing, looking in and learning on a regular basis. And so we thank you dearly for being on the show and being able to share everything that you're going through. And because there's just so many amazing questions that I have. That it's just <laughs> gonna be so fun to jump into and to have you front and center is just crazy. So awesome. Thank you. Today, we look back to the 20th century at the turn of the 20th century and your, your, your great uncle had, he entered the world the same time my grandmother did, 1913, yeah. Gary, Indiana. There are several popular, famous people from Gary, Indiana there. Mm -hmm. But, and he, 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 he came resolute in the sport and became an icon. Tony Zell was one of the first names when I saw the black and white Fighters, you know, when the TV was in black and white, and I was doing, I studied a lot when I was young, Haley. And when I got to see that, I, it was just, you know, what I saw were just so many layers to what it takes to do what he do, what he had to do, which why he had the name the Man of Steel. What are one of the things that you remember most about Uncle Tony? when you were growing up, what is a memory that has stood fast with you over the past several decades that you can remember when you were around someone who's created the kind of legacy that Tony Zale did? Gosh, there's so many, but specifically, I have this memory of his hands. And I always recognize the sort of, um, you know, angelic, atmosphere around him and his hands even though they did so much destruction in the ring were yeah. so soft it wow. was so surprising and the muscles he had in his hand <laughs> <laughs> i mean only a boxer could have those yeah. muscles. um as a kid he would i have an older brother named mm -hmm. tony after our uncle tony and uh, my older brother tony would really want to walk in the footsteps of our great uncle. And Uncle Tony would visit us from Chicago. He would hop on the train, um, the Amtrak, mm -hmm. and visit us in Michigan growing up. Wow. And always Uncle Tony was like, all right, young, you know, young Tony, what have you got? Um, <laughs> and my dad had showed him to protect his face. Mm -hmm. And I have a, a photo that jogs a memory of me also getting in on that conversation. And I was probably okay. like five years old, <laughs> you know, <Okay. laughs> at waist height of Uncle Tony and having my, my, my fists up. And he always said, you have to protect your face. Never drop your fists. You have to protect your face. So that I still remember to this day. And, and I think it's a metaphor in so many other ways beyond just boxing. Yeah, absolutely. And so one of the things that I do as a teacher and educator of coaches and the young generations up, to, up, up and coming is when he would say that that's something that he's trying to repeat to you because it's easy to say it out of your mouth. It's harder to do, 
you understand the, the layers of boxing and learning boxing and having muscle memory. And that's one of the key reasons I tell guys now that if you really pay attention to the old, older fighters who, lay, who paved the way, so they had to get hit harder because they were still learning and figuring it out. But at the end of their tenure, they became what we call, they etched in stone as the, the, the blueprint on how to do it. Absolutely. Well, I have a, yes, and when you say he told you that over and over, it is something that few, very few people understand how hard it, it, it takes to, for that to land. So I always tell the guys, you know, you say it repetitiously. And they're the people who watch the feeds like we're doing today. Uh, our podcast, you know, we reach over 1.7 million people every single month. It never fails. It goes higher, but it never trumps that. And your, your message has to land. So to have a legend, <laughs> Hall of Famer, someone who did it at the elitist and the highest of levels in one of the toughest weight classes to do it against stubborn guys like Graciano. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love Rocky. <laughs> Yo, are you serious? So how, I mean, people are chiming in crazy right now, so I will definitely pop off a question or two, but I want you to take my audience through what it's like being boxing royalty and you have to take this because I know you're a modest person but you're very very vivacious and you're an advocate for our sport and you are a person that I tell those who are watching me to pay attention to people like you who are royalty and you will never say anything to misdirect and misguide anyone who's in the sport whether they're young or if they're coaches what you have is something that everybody can't say they've had and that's a lineage of blood that <laughs> is X and stone in our history of America. So how can the boxing community galvanize around what you, from royalty speaking to them, the message that you have based upon what they're trying to do and how you've taking on the role that you have because i've watched the stuff you're doing mm -hmm. you're you're like punch you in the face kind of chick oh <laughs> you don't play around so right. what message would you have to them who are trying to go down that route and you already have seen as a youth what it takes to get there you know give them a piece of advice just for the young and the coaches and the people who don't you have to have walked that walk you have to have been around that lineage yeah, and you have to, to understand what it is because they have a a, a a swayed vision of it. So explain to them and give them a little breakdown of it. Yeah, the first, um, really, the first key word it comes down to is discipline and having self discipline. Yeah. And I studied acting uh, with a method trained coach, and that's what he taught me as well. And thankfully, I already had that in my body because of my uncle Tony and my dad. Yeah. and always having discipline especially um during this covid time it's easy to just chill out and watch netflix but wow. you have to stay regimented and disciplined uncle tony was he was running six miles a day well until his 70s he actually died at his uh fighting weight he consistently kept his weight and he never slacked he um he never had to cut weight for a fight he just maintained it. And I think something that helped him with that discipline was his faith. He mm -hmm. was devoutly Catholic in such a way that he was pretty shy and kind of um, kind of hid away from the limelight. And, yeah. uh, but also that deep root in him of being raised Catholic, he had that discipline. You know, yeah. Sunday mornings, after a Saturday night fight, he'd be first row to pew at, at mass. Wow. So I think if, um, if someone's watching and they want to be a champion, I think that they really need to continue uh, every day to make it a part of your routine. And, yes. you know, they say work hard, play hard. Yeah. And boxing, you get, just got to work hard. Forget about you gotta, the plan. <laughs> you got to really, really work hard. And 
what I'm doing now is I want you specifically to speak. What people don't understand right here is they think the word, the phrase changing levels is new. He was changing levels here, faint and low, coming up high. Mm -hmm. His body attack was one of the things. Yes. The body attack. Yeah, he perfected that. There was times um, when he was watching my grandpa, uh, his brother Joe, yeah. watching my grandpa Joe fight, and he knew he needed, just by watching, um, he knew he needed to come up with a combination yeah. that would always work. And yeah. that's when he came up at a young age, the right to the heart and left to the chin. And man, did he deliver. And when you see this, look at him, he did it again. People literally think Mike yeah. Tyson created this punch and Mike Tyson's great, but it's like, he even admits that he's learned from the greats like these guys. Look at the combination and yeah. the masterful power delivery. It's force, force, force. There we go, bam. That's the sweet science right there. That's the sweet science. And when you see Graciano, that's a guy you don't want to be in a ring with. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he was a beast. He's just <laughs> relentless. Mm -hmm. But seeing that, how does that feel? Explain when that has all, that feather is already in the legacy of your family's cap. Because a lot of these individuals, they have no point of reference. When you see that, what do you see? What does that feel like? I feel really proud. And I also continue to learn. Um, it's amazing. I was judging amateur in Chicago and I judged a kid who was reminding me of Uncle Tony's um, tactics and stature. He was actually a middleweight. And I found out after that mm -hmm. his coach had been coached by my uncle Tony. Oh. So to see that, I mean, it was unrecognizable. So I feel so much pride. And I also noticed how light he is on his feet. Yeah. And uncle Tony loved to dance. He was a polka dancer. He would dance all night long. And I think, you know, wow, that, that's it. It, do, it develops that's coordination. It putting the punk combinations together, Lomachenko. Yes. Muhammad Ali. Yes. And the Holyfields alluded to doing his dance routines for long periods of time every weekend throughout the week. And that was part of the regimen that you're not doing in the boxing gym. Right. <laughs> I always wanted to clarify to people like great football players like Lance Swan, Pittsburgh Steelers in the building, always did things. He did ballet for range of motion, flexibility. And when I seen how, you know, the man of steel would change levels and move, and it takes such coordination. Definitely. So it's very important that people understand how you take what you do and manifest it. And, and the choreography of creating that rhythmic movement in your body. Yeah. Advanced. Yeah. And you know what? And you mentioned ballet and ballet also takes a lot of discipline as well. I, I grew up, I did like ballet for 12 years. <laughs> brutal. That's yeah. Brutal. And those are the more, those are the moments you're more sore doing those type things than anything could possibly get. I mean, you're torn from real, like the, the, the many layers of the body, I tell all athletes, and you can attest to this, that for most part, most people train 12 massive muscle groups. But when you're a real pugilist, like your Uncle Tony, he trains 641. Wow. And yeah, so the objective is to understand that boxing isn't about the big stuff you, you can see. It's about the little things and the innuendos that you can see. 
and mm -hmm. I mean that you that are invisible to the naked eye, the stuff, yeah. the fortitude, the the perception, the things that you have to master, along with the skills. Mm -hmm. So when I see that, you know uh, what I see. You know what I see people doing whenever they see a clip like that? They say they see two dudes, they they exhausted and they bumping. I said, no, what you see is two dudes that have been going to war and even when they're tired, they could kill you. Yes. That's what you see. Yes. Get it? <laughs> Get it? Like no matter what that person's under, pressure wise, pressure does not burst those type guys' pipe. They're maniacal. And they both chopped wood, you know, as part of their training. And that's yeah. different muscles than what you can do weightlifting. Yeah. Um, Uncle Tony, the reason how he got his name, the Man of Steel, is because mm -hmm. he went pro and he had something like 21 pro fights within six months. And he was just torn up and yeah. starting to lose. And he <clears throat> knew that he was being mismanaged. So mm -hmm. he, he quit. He retired from boxing in his young 20s. And he showed up to the steel mills of Gary, Indiana. Yeah. And he said, give me the toughest job you got. And they handed him a shovel. And so he shoveled slag into these molten hot turbines for over a year. He was working wow. in the steel mills and he did any kind of manual labor they had because he knew that he was working a different muscle group than what you could yeah. just in, in regular training. I want you to do one thing for me, Haley. <laughs> I love that headshot. <laughs> Great headshot. And when I go here, I want you to, I'm gonna show you a picture and I want you to speak to it. I'm not gonna ask you a question. I'm just, as soon as you see the picture, just speak specifically to it. And. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a tough one. And you know, it's, it's amazing to see Mike Tyson just really. Yeah. <clears throat> Mike Tyson has been called a lot of things, but one thing Mike Tyson is, is boxing. Yeah. And I know <clears throat> how much my, my father spoke with, I, I think his trainer on the phone, Customato, and, you know, mentioned this decades ago, mentioned how, he would show Tony Zale fights to Mike Tyson. So to see him yes. manage to the belts there and yeah, and they, I mean, they're still missing. Yeah. It's been five years. It's been and, um, it's, it's, it hurts me so much because it's, um, I know it's just a trophy, but it was, no, it's not. <laughs> it's, it's, it was I, I played football when I was 10, 11, and 12. That's just a trophy. Yeah, okay, okay, true. <laughs> I get you. It's not, um, it's but those trophy. belts were designed for him. They're handmade. They're yeah. relics, and they don't make those belts anymore, the ring belts. You know, it's yeah. a relic. But also what it represents in, in my family history is, oh, yeah, it got the Zales out of the ghetto of, um, yeah. of Gary, Indiana. And it, it offered my dad opportunities in his athletic career, which led to his education. So there's so much wrapped. Yeah. In that. So the story in which those belts tell is one of the reasons you wear it around your waist with such great pride and you wear it in your legacy and your lineage and what your blood, what you're made of. It, 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 it's an identity for a sector of you, a character within yeah. that you will do whatever's necessary. It's your Bible. It's what your DNA strands say about you. And that's a global thing, world champion and mm -hmm. not just once but multiple times the the lineage is is uber important i always try to talk to my uh, the young audience the older people there are a lot of people who are, who are older who haven't been in a position to be in a direct lineage so i always try to let them know what 
going for those titles mean? And it just, it's more than just a title. Mm -hmm. It proclaims a sector of what you are DNA wise, it's your DNA strands. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so important that individuals talk when things like this have been done and excoriate individuals who go to these places, dark places, and strip someone's life work. And that's one of the reasons we want to galvanize behind you with this and speak to it. We made sure that this was a part of it because if they can find Tom Brady jersey. <laughs> exactly. You feel me? Mm -hmm. They yeah, can. There, there is a bit of news on the belts. Um, they're still missing, but last November of 2019, they did um, arrest a guy in the middle of a theft in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And his DNA matched the DNA from our crime. And I believe he did admit to stealing them. Um, and what? it's still under investigation. Where did they go after he stole them? Um, I know there's several different um, states and police units that are involved and also the FBI and, and, mm -hmm. and track them down. But um, at least it's good to know that whoever did take these um, is no longer out there. You know, he's, he's not going to yeah. steal any more memorabilia. Well, I tell you what. I don't think that person wants to be seen in the boxing community because if, he's, <laughs> if so, it's going to be smoke. And uh, I don't think they want those problems because it's going to be some real problems. Uh, it's just unfortunate. But I can tell you this, as I see Mike Tyson standing there, Deb Zell wants everybody to know that Mike Tyson was trained with Tony Zell tapes. So just for those who are out there who did not know that it was not just all of the Jack Dempsey's of the world, but it's the Tony Zales. And it's obvious, you can see so much, so much of Mike Tyson and Tony Zell. And yeah. these are the things that we, we, we created the Boxing Royal Series only because you got to understand how to connect the DNA of boxing history and who were the guys who laid the foundation. And Tony Zell, the man of steel, the only man of steel that I seen proclaimed as a man of steel is in a movie. This yeah. is the real deal. This is not Hollywood. Right. This is a man going out there doing it for real and at the highest level. Thank you for acknowledging that and understanding how special those belts are. It's really nice. Thank you. Boom. <laughs> oh, I love this picture. Yeah, this was, I think, Uncle Tony's 75th birthday. Uh, that's my grandma Zale uh, to his left there, my, my grandma. Nice. Um, it's just so sweet. He used to call me uh, Miss America. <laughs> and He's planting it. Yeah, right, right. Uh, he saw big things for me. <laughs> boxing. He's training, training the mind to think that manner. That's mm -hmm. exactly boxing. I tell people, it's not always in a ring with gloves on. Yeah. It's how the brain operates. It's how he maneuvers in everything in his life. Mm. You know, he boxes. You don't just box and against an opponent all the time. You box at work. You box in relationships. You box when it comes down to family, for sure. But at the end of the day, it's all the method and how you handle something. When it's hot, you back out. When it's cold, you go in. Mm -hmm. It's just about maneuvering and adapting to things that are happening to you. And it was obvious he had to get his face back against Graciano. He went back and said, hey, I know how to adjust to this. And that's how he handled life. So it's beautiful to see these pictures. And I want to know the story behind. <sighs> <laughs> I love that. That's such a great photo. Is that not amazing? And the star power in these things. It captures the old school and that is history. That is the moment they captured. And not everybody was really involved in the real fight game, but it was so crazy is how they captured the history, the spirit of the sport. Classic. Aw, Jake. Oh my gosh. I love that man. I miss him. 
Um, this was the first time I met him at the International Boxing Hall of Fame in Canastota. Yeah. Um, but I, gosh, dozens of times, he actually um, had me in his off-Broadway cabaret one time, and uh, uh, that was really cool. I got to walk him into the stage. Um, I wore his leopard print <laughs> wow. robe and had the hood on, and I wore a leopard print dress Great. underneath. It was so glam. It was a lot of fun, but I was shadow boxing in, uh -huh. the, in the spotlight. Actually, they lit it from behind, and there was like smoke, so it was just the silhouette of ushering him in to the stage. It was really cool. Wow, <laughs> that is insane. Uh, and you know what he told me about Uncle Tony? Yeah. He just said, your uncle was a great fighter. And just hearing that from oh, Jake yeah. LaMotta. From was the Raging a, Bull. The Raging Bull, <laughs> exactly, yeah. Crazy. They actually, um, when Tony came out of World War II, he was in the Navy, so his title of middleweight champion was frozen. And yeah. he had to prove it right away um, when he was back he had to prove that he was still champion so mm -hmm. in 1946 they were trying to figure out who he was going to fight they wanted it to be in new york and at yankee stadium and they had talked about jake lamata but they said no no he's not famous enough we need rocky graziano so it ended up being the you know the beginning of one of the greatest trilogies in boxing history boy oh boy mm -hmm. if anyone has not seen that trilogy go to youtube i'm actually going to put a link in the description and you're talking about smoke. Mm -hmm. I mean, Wars. guys today, one of the things that I note is that we call them attribute fighters. They, they got guys who are super quick, super fast, super long or strong. And they play to those attributes. But you got guys who had the power, the strength, the quickness, but they didn't use it until it was necessary. These are pugilists. Mm -hmm. so the difference between those guys back then is you can take a guy who has attributes and you can take those attributes away from him. And that's what guys like uh, Tony Grill did, Zell did, and uh, I was gonna say Graciano, mm -hmm. Raging Bull. If you can say I beat Sugar Ray Robinson, end of discussion. Okay, yeah. and, and, and how can you do that if you don't understand something about stripping a person down of their attributes? You're mm -hmm. talking about a man who knocked out over 109 people and Sugar Ray Robinson just beat a person who has that kind of boxing of consciousness is, is absolutely insane. So yeah. having these, these videos now, and I'm a historian, I also have the entire library of boxing from 1890, like seven. Oh, that's amazing. Day. So I still had all of those fights. So I was very, very, very in tune to Tony Zell. You know what I mean? Growing up, young, snotty nose, come in, turn on those videotapes, VHSs, still got them all, all of them. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I was, about, I was in the move and I was, I, I was emptying out one of my garages and I was like, I got to just get rid of this stuff. You know, I got to transfer all these old VHSs over to DVD. And yep. I said, it's just too much work. I said, I, I text J. Marie Moore, Archie Moore's daughter. And I was like, yeah, I'm about to get rid of it. She said, you better not. Good for her. Yes. <laughs> I know. You yeah. can't do treasure. I, oh, don't get it twisted. Uh -huh. I... That probably, I would have shrunk three inches if I would have done that. Because my, <laughs> life, my life has been dedicated to the history of, of boxing and taking it. And what we do here on the Fight Show is bridge the casual fan to the elitist, okay? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. make it clear, give perspective, and really break it down. Because I really do it with these guys. So it's not some talk show guy who don't understand the boxing world. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, the lineage as well. So understanding how important it is for them not to have just a, their own impulsive perception of boxing and see the layers and the blanket that really the, 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 the system and science of boxing is built from. 
So Absolutely. if you, these guys have not really taken the time to study and watch guys like Tony Zell, Rocky Graciano, you know, Jake LaMotta, you got to go back and do your homework. Even the Manassa Mola, you know who I'm talking about, <laughs> Jack Dempsey. These guys were problems and they would have totally survived in this era, 1000% being world champions and reigning as well because okay. of what they were able to do with fighters who fight with attributes and don't understand the science, the sweet science, the boxing. Yes. So since this pandemic has taken effect, what is something that you have done? How have you mentally handled this thing on a day-to-day -day basis? I've done three things a day consistently. One yeah. is something that makes me feel accomplished, whether or not it's like a small task or a chore. Yes. Something that brings me joy, like a hobby or um, anything that I might enjoy, or, and something social. Uh, either a phone call or a FaceTime or a Zoom, yeah. something, um, you know, doing those three things every day has helped me stay positive and know that we're going to get through this. And um, it's a really unique time. I, I don't know if we'll ever have this time again in our, our lives. I, I, hope, I hope we don't, but there's really an opportunity here to use the time wisely. And yes. Uh, I wrote a screenplay actually about uh, my uncle Tony five, six years ago, actually five years ago. And um, it's an adaptation from my dad's book, but I've completely re started to rewrite it and bring in more of Rocky Graziano. So now you're getting their friendship, which is a story that's not often told about two foes who are actually friends, even though they're supposed to, you know, battle each other in the ring. So um, at yep. least there's something that I can do that still uh, inspires me is to, um, you know, keep thinking about Uncle Tony's life and, and how, I mean, being born in 1913, yes. he, he survived the Spanish flu and just like your, your grandma. Yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah. She lived to 98 years old. You know, she, <laughs> she saw the her. century and I mean, she was a she was a freak of nature, man. <laughs> she was a fighter. She would have been a world champ too. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, she was she was a tough one, and just learning and asking questions about her life growing up, and just the the, the responsibilities. That's the the fiber of world champions. Just cooking, starting to cook at nine years old, and having real responsibilities. My my grandmother was special. And just looking at the lineage of these individuals that we're talking of, and what we have here on the screen right here is Tony Zell's book. Uh, so you need to grab your copy over here at www.tonyzell.org, The Man of Steel. So make sure you guys go check that out. And if you want to learn about boxing, you learn from people who are really in about their life. And this is how you will learn how to get into position where you can operate like these individuals if you learn what they've gone through if you learn the trials and the tribulations and not expect things to come to you just because you want them to you have to have pandemics to check yourself and to not feel like everything needs to be handed to you those are the things that are different between successful people and people who will not stop regardless of what situation they're in. You get knocked down, you go back to Archie Moore, Yvonne Durrell, four knockdowns, you know, hard punches. And later, Archie Moore speaks to meeting Yvonne Durrell at the, they had a, an, an event up in maybe Australia, last, uh, Australia, it was somewhere, but he got to meet him. He said he shook his hand. He said his hands was <laughs> like twice the size of his. And he was like, man, you know, how, do you, how are your hands? He was like, salt water, fishing. Oh, there you go. <laughs> and, you know, he was from Canada. So he's like, yo, that's big time, you know. So he was like, 
And that was one of the secrets that, you know, Archie Moore picked up on learning things from people who are at those higher levels. And Yvonne Dorel was a problem in that ring. I mean, amazing. yo, yeah. So I have a secret that I can share with you. Okay. Um, I, uh, I know back nowadays we have protein shakes and, you know, Gatorade, electrolyte drinks and all that stuff. Lemon water. Lemon. Actually, Uncle Tony drank lemon water every morning his whole life. Yeah. That's why. <laughs> yeah. And he, um, so when he was training, because he did a lot of uh, youth outreach after he retired and he was um, working at like 26 different gyms in Chicago for the um, CYO in the Chicago Parks District. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, Muhammad Ali anonymously donated um, all the equipment to fill up all those gyms in the 70s when he was champion. Wow. So the, the secret I have to share is back in the day when they didn't have Gatorade, mm -hmm. right before his boy, uh, his, whoever he was training would go into the ring, he would pop a sugar cube in their mouth. <laughs> and to get the sugar rush, a sugar yeah. rush. Yeah, that'll carry you. <laughs> yeah, exactly, just to see hey. the beginning. Cause when you're when you're at that level, you gotta have stuff. Mm -hmm. I, you know what I do with the guys, and I, I explain it to them is, you know, there are skills. And then you learn skill sex. After you learn your techniques, and then you start to learn the 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 concepts of boxing. And as you progressively get down, you start learning craft. Mm -hmm. intake food and how to handle scenarios in the ring when you're in there with great fighters with great attributes and they know how to use them so when you say that it's a reason why he knew how to do that and why he did it because you had to have been faced with adversity before yes. you know so to hear that is is uber cool now you're gonna have guys out here trying to fix some chicken cubes out <laughs> Imagine. Hey. <laughs> you chew it with your mouthpiece in. I don't know. <laughs> oh, oh, well, you know, this is what it is. This is why we, we, we break this in and we start to speak to it because people do not have insight. Who's talking to people who are really not from the inside of boxing? Or just say, for instance, they are at a boxing gym where there's no legacy yet. Mm -hmm. Do you yes. realize how important it is that yeah. you are saying things like that? And those are real things. You got to get to that level where, you know, those things are necessary. Of course, you're not worried about that when you're fighting your first amateur fight and stuff. But as I speak about the amateurs, tell us what you're doing now in boxing. Yeah, so um, I've been an amateur judge for a little bit over four years okay. uh, with USA Boxing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Started my training at Gleason's Gym in New York. And oh, then I moved, Bruce. yeah, right, Bruce. And then I moved to Chicago for a couple of years. And um, it was, that's, I was really um, excited to get to know that city and how it's different yeah. than New York, because it's quite different. And the Chicago kids, I mean, the kids I was judging, they were really well matched. There's a lot of boxing yeah. talent in the amateurs <laughs> in Chicago. Yeah. So um, then I moved back to New York and um and went resumed judging amateurs there in fact right before uh everything shut down in mid-march there was going to be um two nights of amateur bouts at mm -hmm. the garden in the theater and i was going to go and hopefully get into the rotation of judging so i i know that we will resume with um the olympics being postponed mm -hmm. another year it's like i i know what uncle tony would say that you know health and safety is first yeah even though we're all eager and and want to you know yeah. do what we're made to do so um i uh with usa boxing they've sent out um a questionnaire asking what our comfort level is as officials and uh it sounds like they might have some trial te they're calling them test bouts mm -hmm. where there's nobody in the audience you have yeah. just the officials and yeah. just boxers yeah and then hopefully eventually they'll start bringing people in i mean they're talking about ppe for the officials mm -hmm. uh, wearing you know, masks of course and it'll it'll be different for a while but i think we will see boxing uh, yeah well i think yeah you know, they can take some some 
they can take a few pointers from what the UFC has done, stepping into the uh, arenas and you're already starting to see them populate a little bit more with just kind of like people who are on staff. Yeah. Just enough people. I mean, you go to a, a you know, a quality event and it's, it's the, the, the energy is always good. Um, mm -hmm. Jeff once said they still make those, those, those sugar cubes <laughs> uh, yeah. Drop in the comment box. And she also said that book is fire. So make oh. sure you guys take the time to go up there and check it out because it is, you know, they get legacy, they get lineage. And what we run is I have a I run a school of boxing for coaches um, online globally. And they always are looking to get very, very enlightened on things. And we very, very we, we cross every T, we dot every I and we hook every C with the education of boxing. So they'll definitely be on this, this feed right here. School of Boxing, TSOB, stand up. Make sure everybody know you're in the building. They are, you're gonna see them. But with that being said, I know you're just such an advocate and you are, today what's gonna happen is you're gonna have a whole new following of people who understand your responsibility and your level of responsibility as a boxing royal. And I would love for you to speak specifically on, you know, your stance on the, the the social injustice and how as a boxing royal do you think your voice could be powerful to aid in change yeah i uh really looked to uncle tony and where he was during the civil rights movement yeah. in the 1960s and he was on the campaign trail with bobby kennedy um and wow. really believed that he could instill change and yeah. He went to Gary, Indiana, um, Chicago. He went to black neighborhoods in Indianapolis and mm -hmm. Northwest Indiana and Detroit. And- Whoa. Um, really, <laughs> Yeah, that's real. Yeah, he went to some poverty stricken areas with Bobby as, um, I think Bobby hired a couple of people to be his security, like Rosie Greer and Tony Zale, he, fired, he hired good old, old <laughs> boxers and football players. Yeah, good people to have in your corner. <laughs> yeah, exactly, to ride on the table with him. Here's actually a photo of it. Oh, um, wow. You could post it on the, the link if you want to see. Yeah, it. awesome. So That's crazy. Those were the names back then, too. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So to know that he um himself was persecuted because he was polish and experienced um a lot of bigotry himself he yeah. really i he think sure. with bobby could have done some really wonderful things for equality in the country yeah and you know now i just i have to say that you know we can't we have to progress it's been 400 years of yeah injustice and i'm so happy to see uh champions like um like aj come out and talk about yeah, yeah. you know stand with black lives matter and yeah. and to understand we don't know what it feels like to be another race we can't yeah. even really imagine mm -hmm. but we have to try and we have to fight for equality and i think a lot of it is people who are who feel in a minority yes at any level you know it, because no matter if that one is your your battle by itself or is it just the, the the minority wave that you have to deal with but when i say that people are good inside you can just see people realize feeling comfortable enough to step up and feel getting comfortable with being a little uncomfortable yes so definitely. i took my caps to everyone who stepped up and and and, and fighting the good fight mm -hmm. because in the boxing community you know that's what is the fiber of this community is being able to step in remember when ali couldn't fight mm. what did joe frazier do he gave him money mm -hmm. gave him opportunity and you look at all of these guys you know it's countless scenarios uh, when Mayweather paid for Gino Hernandez's funeral, you're yeah. looking at all of these gestures from fighters because we might battle, but we battle so we can help each other out. At the end of the tunnel, that is the end game. 
So one day I could help you in your situation and then together you could still, you try to fight your way from poverty, from the scenarios in which you, your, your uncle was in. And if that didn't work out, even after being champion, you'll have someone start a foundation for you and get behind it so that that family that follows will benefit from all of the blood, sweat, and tears. So with that being said, that was beautiful, beautifully said by you, Haley. But there are a lot of women that will be watching this and that are watching right now. And they want to be strong. They want to be advocates. They want to look the part. They just don't have the guideline and the understanding and clarity of how to go about doing it. Give them, speak to them about how you go about carrying that threshold carrying that banner, that torch in which you're doing to become a strong vocal woman in this country? I think now is the time that uh, women are being listened to more and taking, taken more seriously. And mm -hmm. I'm really happy to hear that there's, and to meet some of them, that there's more women in boxing who yes. uh, are getting involved in every way. And yeah. I totally respect that. And I'm so grateful that finally the um, Canastota is now inducting women into the International Boxing Hall of Fame. Yes. Um, and you know, the really uh, sex aside, we're, right. all, we're all fighters. We all need self-defense. Absolutely. And every day that we wake up, we have to make the best out of it and stand up for obviously what we believe in. And mm -hmm. I think there's a camaraderie, something that's really beautiful in the boxing world Yes, that I've experienced. And um, I've been so grateful to be welcomed into it. And I look forward to form more bonds with more women. And welcomed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm honored, yes. <laughs> Well, I think your uncle solidified you being welcome a long time ago. <laughs> being welcome isn't the right phrase I would use. Being able to find your voice may be, you know, yeah. something that would be more appropriate for you, but you are boxing royalty and every punch he threw would benefit you today. Now, one of the things I gotta ask you before we wind this thing down is, Who's your favorite fighter today that reminds you of your uncle? Oh, wow. I, I love many for different reasons. I love Lemoncello. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, did I say, I said Lemoncello. Lemoncello. We know you love Lemoncello. Oh, sorry. I love Lemoncello too. I had some. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Great. I also, I love Deontay. I love the heavyweight division right now. I love okay, AJ. Right. I love Andy Ruiz Jr. Um, I I really love Andy Ruiz Jr. I know that his second match, oh. with AJ, <laughs> you know, it wasn't his. All victim. Yeah, exactly. All victim. exactly. I think that's a common thread is once you get to that that top of your game, once you get that belt and that title, how do you maintain it? <laughs> Where do you go from there? Oh, funny. The lights get bright. Yes, and I, I, I respect Andy Ruiz because he's had quite an amateur career. I mean, Uncle Tony had over yeah. 207 amateur fights. Yeah. So I really love those who come from an amateur background. Yeah, um, so, so much. And the necessary, the, 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 the muscle memory in which you have to stack over top and stack and stack. You go to the gym every day, coach says the same thing to you for 10 straight years. Mm -hmm. You can't just pick up boxing easy. You need to have that growth and that development. And yes. people reach out to me all the time. I'm, I'm 47. Is it too late for me to box? I said, well, if you're asking, it is. Because <laughs> if you're about it, you're about it. Mm -hmm. You're going to do it. Any, you, you, you don't need to ask anyone for, for permission. You're going to ask someone for, for permission. If you're having a swing at somebody, you're going to ask. Like in fighting, fighters are born, not made. You know, yeah. that, that you, you don't ask that. There's no one that's ever worn that green belt, the red one, the black one, who's asked, <laughs> can I fight? Like, you are a fighter. You're born that way. Look at there. 
That's yeah. the green belt. <laughs> Pretty amazing. It, it, it says it itself, the green belt. The most prominent statement in the world mm -hmm. is the green belt, <laughs> period. End of that discussion. There is no other argument for that. And when you can strap that, that is just absolutely. There's Uncle Tony. There he is, right beside Muhammad and right beside that WBC at yeah. 30 pounds. Look at those legends up there. That is, <laughs> look at that company. That's yeah. the Mount Rushmore boxing. Yeah, it's really amazing. It's hand painted. It's so beautiful. And it was an amazing tribute to mm -hmm. our uncle because the WBC came in in the 50s, I believe. Um, and Uncle Tony had already retired by then. But it is something very special and it represents so much. And mm -hmm. um, I, I would love to see boxing unity in one solitary champion for each weight division. I would love to see that. <laughs> but yeah. I, I, I know that. that means, yeah. Haley, that would mean the WBC, the WBO, the IBF, and the WBC all would have to get in bed and start conversating. And that means uh, a conjunction of power. So you'd have to strip power for all the people who are all at, at the pinnacle of the, each other division and there yeah. would have to be one name. So Dana White, I feel like, set a model that he saw boxing didn't have. So he went out, think about when he was going to the gyms and at the gym with Mike Tyson, and, and he saw those holes. And he was like, man, and he created a conglomerate, the UFC. And it, the thing about that is boxing's power is so compartmentalized, and everybody doesn't, no one wants to give up that power. Yeah. So it's hard to, to, you know, can there be a governing body over everything? Yeah, maybe it starts with conversations like this yeah. and government. And I'd love to see some sort of health um, and pension program for retired boxers. Yeah, and you know what? This is why we do stuff like this, because we start to get the conversation going. And I'm a little bit crazy, so I pushed the envelope. I just got off the phone with the mayor about other things when it comes down to the country and, and at large. And, yeah. you know, as you were texting me in, in, through the messenger, and I was like, I was on the call just finishing there and I don't do anything myself as a person just to do it. When I do something, I go all the way. Mm -hmm. You know, I, if we bring up the conversation, my next thing is call to action, awesome. period. Yeah. yeah, so that's one of the reasons I didn't, I just, ah, went and grabs you up and was like, let's get it popping. And the world Thank is you. gonna be one more step closer to things changing in the sport of boxing. Absolutely. Yeah, I know you got the right DNA. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was saying. So any closing words that you wanna share with the audience and everybody? And before you go, I'm gonna put this back up on. I want people to take the, take the initiative and to go up here and grab this book because <laughs> you know when it's all said and done, the man of steel, it's a real thing. So, and Haley, I'm gonna tell you this, you know, I got so many people who are so, so much into Tyson. Well, this is where those things came from. Custiamato was no stupid guy, get right. it? Mm -hmm. He knew what he was doing by studying all of these fighters. He was a philosopher. His mind just was, the, was his athleticism. And he studied all of these guys and mutated and created and started to fuse those guys with that system in which is very popular now and made very popular by Mike Tyson. And that's where it's all starting. So if you're a Mike Tyson fan and we produce books, so those of you who are asking in the comment box, have I written books? All of the books that I've written is on uh, www.masterboxingllc.com. Yes, I have, and I'm not promoting my stuff, but is that people are asking, and yes, I have, because I don't just stop with doing conversations. We have to put ink to pad, and I got 18 books wow. about boxing, skills development, and, and the, the, the tutorials and video lessons, 
only because it's so important because what we have to do is take the time to, to, to educate the world on what our sport is. They talk about Tom Brady on football. ESPN dedicates his time there. UFC is even getting a lot of light in what they're doing in Bellator. Now, in boxing, we got to grab the shackles because when it's all said and done, boxing stands alone, period. So make sure you go up there, check out that TonyZell.org. Go check it out because that's where the real lineage of boxing began. And if nothing tells you, his birth date, 1913. <laughs> period <laughs> all right so make sure you guys check it out Haley we thank you for coming on board any message to your audience that you'd like to share the floor is yours I'd like to say the two things that you have to have but can't be taught are patience and persistence there's so much involved that every day you have to be patient and you have to be disciplined and continue to dream big and to remember the champions of the past because mm -hmm. a lot of them get forgotten. Yeah. But they've paved the road for you into yeah. the present day boxing era. Yeah. Um, I do have handwritten notes. Actually, Dad, do you want to come here for a sec? <laughs> My dad, uh, who's the author of Tony Zale, The Man Bring of the Steel. Arthur in. Let him, let him put his <laughs> face on the camera. We have the handwritten notes of Uncle Tony who- um, Welcome aboard. Uh, thank you. Ted thank Zale, you. my dad. Um, man, behind the man. Uncle behind Tony. The girl. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome aboard on the fight show. <laughs> you bet. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, man. Pleasure so, we to should talk to you sometime about Uncle Tony's handwritten notes on how to box. Yes. Something that, especially with yeah. your science oh, uh, direction, yeah. that you would appreciate. Oh my gosh, yes. We got to do a whole segment on that alone. Just to, just because I know you took the time, uh, Mr. Zell, that you knew that what he did was just immaculate. And to take it and take the reins, you know, that's when I say they looking down from, on, from heaven at what you're doing and, and just is like bowing to that because it takes a lot to go through it. No one gives you that extra credit. No, you just don't. have to do it because yeah. you're cut from the cloth to do it. And we appreciate it. I mean, 1000% because we want our audience to realize the, 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 the dedication. It's not just a sound bite that it takes to do that. You have to be goal oriented, set the plan, execute, and then go out there and promote what you've done so people can really benefit from it. So I know that's why you put it together for, for the benefit of those who are falling in line with what Uncle Tony Zell, Uncle the Man of Steel. Man of Steel. <laughs> you know, just a, a couple of quick things about Uncle Tony. Number yeah. one, he never saw color. Yeah. He never saw color. Yeah. He looked at the man that he was oppo his opponent. Didn't matter. Yeah. He wanted, number one, to find out what he was about and how good he was. Yes. And then find a way to beat him. <laughs> it's awesome. After, after the match, it was all over with. That's why he and Graziano became such great partners. Beautiful. After, after their trilogy, uh, Rocky once said, you know, if there hadn't been a referee in the ring, one of us would have been dead. <laughs> so these were not. Yeah. Fighting. These were battles. And these, yeah. this was a war. Yeah. And one of us was going to come out on top and the other one was going to be on the bottom. So <laughs> question about their, their genuine heart. Yes. Uh, the other item I wanted to mention to you, uh, you know, Uncle Tony ha had his first amateur bout when he was 15 years old. Wow. He got hit so hard in his solar plex that he could hardly breathe the rest of the, the match, and he lost it. And he asked his brothers, you know, how can you get hit like that and take it? And that was the key to his development of that combination that body he would practice and he would get hit and he would practice and he would get hit until he could deliver it when that left came out yeah right went in and, oh. and that then he would the signature was left hook to the chin and that was it he hit so hard too you know i mean with both of his hands 
the punches landed so hard. And, and you think, okay, well, he's a boxer. No, everyone does not hit like that. The yeah. way he's sinking in and use those quads and he just changed his levels, there was such a – it wasn't a technique. It wasn't a skill. It became a craft. He crafted it yeah. into that science in which he mastered it. Because when you're knocking guys out with that, you've mastered it. Because they know you're coming with it, and they still can't stop it. Exactly. That was beautiful, man. And you I know love his power came from his legs. Yeah. yeah. You can see it. He changed levels. And he, he, his blocks, his defensive prowess was totally underappreciated as well. Because we you know, working, these are the things we try to teach the guys that has to be muscle memory. You can't hear it enough. It has to be taught here in yeah. the muscles. Like yeah. the mind, when you're exhausted and drunk from getting hit, your muscles have to take over. Just yes. like what happens when you when you get knocked unconscious, respiratory it takes over on its own. It knows what to do. It's not like you can text it a message. Hey, I'm knocked out. Uh, start breathing for me. Like yeah. <laughs> that's the same thing as blinking. So I'm looking forward to hearing about on a show specifically about the notes of one of the greatest fighters to ever lace them up and laid the blueprint of boxing to some of the fighters who are the guys today, favorite fighters, and they didn't even see those guys fighting. They too young to have seen Tyson in his heyday. And that's the same thing that boxing will. He was at the beginning of the crafting of boxing and the foundation. And Haley, you spoke specifically to it. He wasn't a showy guy. Mm -hmm. So when the showy guys come, they take credit. <laughs> they literally think that the Philly Shell was mastered by only Floyd Mayweather. Like, uh, have you watched Archie Moore? Have you watched these guys back in the day? Like, you, you got to understand that stuff has been around. Those guys was masters and entertaining. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Masters and very entertaining to watch. <laughs> I know I the whole library of all of those fights. So I can't wait to dive in. I am definitely going to get my hands on that book. I'm looking forward to diving in. And I thank you guys for both coming on board. And we will schedule a time and chop it up and let the audience really get to enjoy some of the notes that you guys have and the conversations. And I'm looking forward to it. Thank we you. are too. Thank you. Thanks for helping keep Uncle Tony's legacy alive. Yes, we will do that and do that indeed. And because I'm putting the links to some of his fights in the comment box below and, and our, some of our team are grabbing them from YouTube. And then I want them people to really take the time to really read, you know, and read. Because I know you put together a great story for people to understand the depth of which he lived because he was probably so modest that he didn't even probably want that kind of shine. He just wanted to save his family. And now today you get to appreciate the legacy of Tony, the man of steel, Zell. We mm -hmm. thank you guys for taking the time. I will ask you to say the fight show is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> the fight show is awesome. The fight show is awesome. You bet. Thank you guys, and we will definitely touch base. And I look forward to chopping it up with you guys again. Be blessed at God's feet. And for those of you out on social media, be sure to check these individuals out and get that book. And we will see you next time when we go and get down with Amy Zell, one of the top writers. And she's on the board for the Hall of Fame. So it's going to be great. Friday, 12 o'clock, same time, same place. Be blessed, guys. You too. Keep up Thank the you. good work, Eric. Absolutely.